the earth's a pretty cool place, isn't it? Um, as I reflected, um, we shared that this morning, and um, hi everyone, by the way, I'm Rob, I'm the youth minister here. I have the joy of leading our teenagers, they're great fun, and um, hello to anyone new, and uh, I'm just going to share um, from Climate Sunday. But I, just when I was reflecting there, um, when sometimes I drop my wife off at work and I have to drive back from Christchurch, and does anyone have a spot that you think... I'm not very like garden savvy or have any kind of clue what looks nice or what's good or what's dead or not. I, my wife will tell you I'm rubbish at that. But if I drive back from Christchurch, I will go across the beachway and as you come over from Boscombe at that time in the morning, it just kind of peers over the hill and you just get like this amazing view of the sea and it like wows me every time and I think, yeah, that looks pretty good. Fair play to the guy that made that, like, you know. Like, even me, like quite a Philistine when it comes to nature or that kind of look, I think, yeah, it looks really cool. And I don't know if you guys have got spots like that, but that imagery is so amazing. And that psalm was from Psalm 104, if you want to go and reference it later. Um, So like I said, we are on Climate Sunday, which I know climate um, at the moment can be quite a divisive um, topic and um, one that can kind of split opinion. If I ask you all today about the pool road closures, we might get some heated debates in this room. I know with my neighbours I've had some, but I won't, I won't start that here. But I don't get the one down there in Churchill Drive. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> but it can really kind of divide and cut opinion. So, But yet we read the opening pages of the Bible and we see that creation, and it is good, and it is made in the image of God's. And it's amazing. And creation is littered all over and the beauty of it throughout the whole of Scripture. So there isn't like one passage that we're going to explore tonight. But it is littered throughout. And I want to ask by starting this one question. So with the people around you or if you're at home, um, ask if anyone's there, your cat, maybe send someone a text. Um, When did you start noticing, when did you start to notice climate issues in your life? So with just the people around you, when did you become aware of climate issues? Go. Just with the people around you, when did you become self-aware of climate issues? All right, we'll bring your conversations to a close. Um, Maybe for some of you, you have like a real pinpoint moment um, when you're aware. But I was reflecting on my um, quite young life. I realize now I'm in my late 20s. I know, sorry everyone. Um, But I was reflecting on and talking to someone else earlier that um, when I was younger, there wasn't even like a recycle bin. We had to go take recycling to the recycle plant. I remember when I grew up, my grandparents having to crush the recycling and it was by the doctor's surgery and we'd walk up and take it in and throw it in. And I had a fear of wasps every time of throwing the jam jars in that I might get stung. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, But And so that was kind of... I remember recycling roughly, and then as I got older, I only, um, I remember studying uh, Yellowstone National Park in geography about if the volcano were to explode, what would happen in 2008-9, the Iceland volcano exploding. Um, But it never really was quite prominent in my school life, as far as I can remember. I remember it being spoken about. And as I reflect on this, as a youth pastor here, I realise it's come very much in the fruition of the last five years. Probably the biggest uproar in later English history, it was probably the 5p bag scandal. I worked in Sainsbury's at the time. The uproar from people was outrageous, that having to pay that 5p for a bag. And now we don't, it's not too much of a stress. People are much better at being equipped with this bag. But actually, it's been more prolific in the last five years or so. And when we're looking at events uh, like Extinction Rebellion or thinking about climate change and young people and their views... Actually, it's been very prolific in their lives right now. And I chat to young people often. It's great. I love that part of my job. And I know for some many that it feels like a burden, that they hear this, like, world is going to end in some way, and there's nothing we can do about it, and it's not that great. It's not the view that I stand on, but it's something that I want to make people aware of, that young people are anxious about this. And we all have a response to do that. And I feel like I'd be doing them a disservice if I didn't share that with our church. That we're all in this together. So there's a great piece of um, research done by Tear Fund 
called Burning the House Down. So we're going to watch a short clip with that, but if you've got time later on, go to Google, or if you're at home now, um, go to Tear Fund in Group, type Tear Fund, bring down the house, and it's a research project done with over 600 14 to 19 year olds um, with, with some interesting stats, which will come up at the end. So let's hear what they've got to say, and then I'll come back. Dear leaders. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment. With my generation. With my generation. The church makes such positive impacts in society. We make a difference. And that means we can make a difference to climate change. We are all part of God's perfect creation. So let's look after it. Let's look after it. Let's look after it. This is God's world we're looking after. We have a responsibility to look after the planet. That our God created so beautifully. God looked at his creation and he called it good. Personally, I can't help but feel guilty that we've mistreated and exploited it to such an extent that soon the damages will be irreversible. Please, please acknowledge that this is an issue. The church has such an important platform as an organisation within society to speak out. Listen to Jesus' call for us all to lose the bonds of injustice and be stewards of the earth. Climate change is going to affect us all. The poor people will be affected the most. Loving others and the poor is an important thing we are commanded to do. As part of this, we must act to protect the environment as this massively affects lots of lives. We need to be doing so much more. It's time for the church to stand up as an example. Talk about it more. Pray about it. Try and stay positive. And trust God. Make practical steps as a church and encourage the congregation to engage practically. Pray for the planet and help do everything you can to stop climate change. Be bold and don't shy away from preaching on important topics. Challenge our parents to more care and less convenience. Step up. Step up. I haven't heard anything from you. We need to do something now. We have the opportunity and a God who is all powerful behind us. So why haven't we made a change yet? Climate change isn't a problem for yesterday and isn't a problem for tomorrow. It is a problem for right now and it needs to be addressed now. Being passive isn't an option. We need you to lead in this area. Let's start a movement to save God's creation. Please make changes and listen to us. Please listen to us because we want to change and are passionate about changing and reversing climate change. We want to help and we have good ideas. You need to give more opportunities to make a difference to climate change through the church. When the world looks back on the church in 200 years time, will they think that the church helped stop climate change or that it was part of the problem? Will they view the church as a positive part of society and as a catalyst of change or negative and outdated? I hope that churches join the political and environmental fight against climate change and speak passionately about the issue. For the sake of the planet and for future generations, not just for Christians, but for everybody. If we all try to help, we could really make a difference. Please, do something. It's important. And I'd like you to lead the way. But if you don't. If you don't. If you don't. If you don't. Then we will. We will. We will. We will. We will. Thanks, guys. Of the research, it said that 92% of, of those young people that were surveyed said they were concerned about the climate. 66% of those had not heard a sermon on climate change on a Sunday. 55% of them, church leaders, had not spoken to them specifically about climate change. 37% of my church leaders see climate change as something they should care about. And 9% said my church isn't doing enough about the climate. And I read that as pretty hard-hitting stats and thank them for being open and honest. And it's there for you to go look at it yourselves and to sift between. So should global warming change how we live? I um, came across this quote um, from someone Q&A on a podcast. It said, in this day and age, 
when we're bombarded with strong environmentalist and savior propaganda and green ideas, what should the proper response of a Christian to all these pressures? Should we assume that climate change is caused by humans? And how do we find a proper balance in ecological concerns when we're faced by so many things that seem like extremes? Eliminating plastic straws, demonizing fossil fuels, and the rise of couples who refuse to have children because of the impact of, on the environment. It feels like culture really is worshiping the creation instead of trusting the creator. So how could a follower of Jesus care for the creation that will one day be destroyed by fire. The end quote there is quoting from 2 Peter 3.10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. It kind of raises the question, is global warming mainly the only cause by human behaviours, like the use of fossil fuels and the kind of knock-on effect? I don't know. And that, I think, is a discussion that I encourage you to have in your home groups and with each other and to pray about, but that isn't what I want to ask on tonight. But what I do know is that the Bible is clear about the important effects, um, the important effects, the ways that we should live, how we respond to this. There's a real spiritual danger that we treat ecological issues higher than we see God, that we say, oh, no, 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 like it's more important than that and he's not in it. That's not true. And on the other hand, we think that it's all a bit tree huggery and like I'm not getting involved and we poke fun at vegans and this, that, the other, and I'd rather just avoid it. And it depends on the group of people that we're with will depend on that response. And it's not about being people pleasers or just a going with the flow or agreeing with other people that we are doing our research, but we're doing it for the right reasons and the good reasons and the just reasons. So it cuts both ways. So how should a follower of Jesus care for creation that one day will be renewed, that will be restored? And my response is the same. It's like our bodies. Our bodies one day will fade and like the earth will decay and we will decay one day. But it doesn't, we can do things to not speed up that process. Um, we want to make sure that we live healthy lives and we want to look after and ensure that we have a healthy earth and we have responsibilities in Romans 8.10, it says the body will be raised from the dead and the creation will be set free from the bondage to corruption. Just because they will decay doesn't make them worthless now. Doesn't mean that it's all going to be nihilistic and think, oh no, well, we'll just leave it and not worry about it. It's not that at all. It means that it's precious. And in this short time that we have on this earth, that we need to really use it effectively. And we are implements, and if we profess to be Christians, that we use our bodies as living sacrifices for the glory of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, at 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God in your body. And then in Romans 12, 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is spiritual worship. Philippians 1.20 says, It is my eager expectation and hope that Christ will be honoured in my body, whether in life or death, that we make such an imprint on our, our lives, make such an imprint on others, that they're like, yeah, that's what they're known for. They've transformed their town, their city, people. They're like, yeah, and it's left an imprint even when we're gone. Our bodies are an instrument for glorifying God, magnifying Christ and dwelling with the Holy Spirit. But it's not just our individual bodies and our individual responses, that we as a church are one body. We collectively have a responsibility that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, that we all play a part and we've all got skills to ensure that we are living as Christ-like in this place. But that doesn't just mean here. That's every church, every person. And imagine the two billion people that profess to be Christians saying, we are told to steward this planet, to look after it, to not abuse it, to care for it, and stand up and say, no, we want to be counted. And in 200 years, say so the church did make a difference in this, that we use our bodies as living sacrifices for the glory of God. Because I don't want to say that I was a part of making irreversible damage to this planet. As a church, 
this morning that we read a declaration um, that the eco group has put together that we want to take this really seriously as a church and that I want to read um, to you this evening and that we wanna, we're going to make six steps to, do our, to ensure that we are able to fulfill this and really take this seriously. This isn't just words, but actually that we're living out in action to make this happen. So, I'll read it to you. Climate change is here. It is being fueled by humans. It's hurting God's creation. And without action, the negative impacts will result in irreputable damage to people and ecosystems for generations to come. These impacts are inexplicably linked to global injustice and inequality and require urgent action and attention. As a church, we believe that we are implications on such as it's such necessary to declare an emergency. This means that we will do all things responsibly to, can to promote positive climate action to minimize our negative impacts. We as Christians, and we are called to act justly and to show love to our neighbours locally and around the world who are already suffering the effects of climate change. We will act with hope and refuse the temptation to despair. We will reaffirm our trust and love in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And some of the things that you could agree, and Lois Partridge, who's heading that up, I'm sure, and I know Claire and Fear on it, would love to talk to you about that. But briefly, our six targets that we want to make by July 2022 are these. To complete a baseline survey of our carbon footprint. To develop an action plan to minimise our negative corporate impact on the environment and climate. To help restoration where possible. To encourage our members to make relevant lifestyle changes appropriate to their circumstances to encourage action on this emergency in our neighbourhoods, workplaces and other spheres of activity. We unite with others to press nationally and local governments, institutions, large businesses, corporations and other powerful bodies to take faster action against effects of climate change. And finally, to look to be awarded our silver eco-church by Russia, currently bronze. And these are some big things that we ask of you as a church. But they are important. I don't want to hold this view that we're like, well, the earth's going to be renewed, so, you know, let's leave it with Jesus and we deserved it and it's our fault anyway. I don't think that's a view that we hold. And I don't want to just awkwardly avoid people that are like, oh, they're just going on about it again. Like, please stop going on. But actually that we approach this as a church that we've been asked to steward this earth and this world is precious. Our bodies are precious. God wants us to lean, to be responsible with this earth as we are with our bodies. And it starts by falling in love with Jesus more. That the eco in the world is not to be replaced by God. That we deepen our relationship with him to show love to our neighbours who struggle, to stand out for everyone else, to do action and to let the church be known. Not for the negatives, for avoiding the things, but to be known for standing up for injustices, to help people. And that's a big challenge, I just want to say. But it's going to involve all of us getting involved, getting a bit messy and really talking about it and really engaging with it. And it kind of needs to start now. I really think 2020 really got posed the question, what happens when the world stops? And we got to see smog removed and the whole world and transportation and, you know, cities being cleared of CO2. It's quite exciting, really. And so we kind of posed the question, but let's keep pressing into it. Let's keep praying. Let's say, Lord, this is your earth and everything else in it. That's the challenge that is laid bare. And this isn't something that we can solve tonight, but I ask of you to continue praying about it, talking about it with home groups, friends, peers, work colleagues. Make it known. Make it known why you stand up. And because we want to stand up, it's because Jesus cares. And tonight, that as we enter worship, I just ask you to fall in love more with Jesus again. Say, Lord, that you cared so much for me that you died for me, that you have given me life and life in its fall, and my soul is secure in you.
My time on this earth is temporary, but I want to leave an imprint that transforms a nation. And I want the church to be known for the good. So I'm going to pray, and then I'll invite Kate back up. Whatever the Lord wants to do, we'll do. But it's a massive challenge, and I don't say it lightly. So Heavenly Father, I remind us tonight that you are good and that you are perfect, Lord. Lord, this is a massive challenge. And may we as the church stand up. May we take on the challenge. May it be known in this area of Paul and across the globe, Lord. Encourage us. May it not be people pleasers and give in to the world around us, but be known because we are Christ followers that we want to seek justice in this world, Lord. So we do this in partnership with you as one body, the church, in your mighty and powerful name. Amen.